Good morning and welcome to this Atlas Special Interest Group meeting, which combines both the events group and the cultural tourism group in discussing cultural festivals in cities such as Edinburgh, uh, who are our host today. Although we're not there physically, uh, we're going to pay, be paying a lot of attention to the city of Edinburgh as we go through the day. Um, so many thanks to our Edinburgh hosts and to Napier University for, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so hopefully you won't get too many more interruptions during the day. Um, and uh, we can get started on this uh, first ever joint meeting between the Atlas Events Group and the Atlas Cultural Tourism Group. Um, we also have a lot of non-Atlas members joining us. So uh, just for them, Atlas is a global network dedicated to uh, tourism and leisure research and education. It uh, combines uh, many research institutes and universities across the world. And we have a community of about 1400 researchers and teachers in, in the field. Um, the Cultural Tourism Group is actually the oldest um, Atlas research group. It was founded more or less at the same time as Atlas in 1991. And over the last 30 years, we've done a lot of research in cultural tourism, cultural events, cultural attractions, and so on. Uh, we've uh, um, produced a lot of publications. So hopefully we'll be producing another publication as a result of this meeting. And we've also started conversations which have helped to shape our ideas about cultural tourism over time. The events group is a, is a much younger group. It's only about 10 years old. It started off in 2011 at a special interest group meeting in uh, Breda in the Netherlands, but we're already on to our 11th meeting. So we get through quite a lot of work in, in this group. Um, you can find out a lot more about the group and what it's been doing in a paper that we recently published in the Journal of Policy Research in tourism, leisure and events. Uh, I will post a link for that in the uh, YouTube feed in a minute. Um, that tells you all about the history of the events group and all the things that we've been doing, and particularly the uh, uh, project that we have on measuring event experiences. So both the cultural tourism group and the events group have been very active over the years. Uh, we haven't really combined forces yet, but now hopefully we can work together on analysing the role of festivals uh, in different cities. We have uh, a big audience today. We have over 200 people registered for the event. Um, people will be joining us at different times during the day. I'm sure because with this global audience, uh, for some people it's three o'clock in the morning and for some people it's uh, nearly midnight. So uh, the audience will be changing during the day, um, but we're very pleased to have all of those people from, uh, from 36 different countries with us. Uh, the main event will be taking place in the uh, Zoom channel but uh, our audience will be following on, uh, on the YouTube feed and people can ask questions and, and post things on the YouTube feed as well. So hopefully we'll get some interaction going with our virtual audience through the day. And I think now it's time to hand over to our hosts in Edinburgh, to uh, Jane Alley Knight, who will be chairing the uh, panel session that's coming up on festivals, cities and communities. Over to you, Jane. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear and see me. So I'd like to say, first of all, uh, a big good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever in the world you are. Uh, so we do have over 200 people signed up and I think over about 100 people already uh, online with us today from over 34 countries, which is amazing. And we've got a good mix of sort of academics and festival people. Uh, so 
We have people from Barbados, from Melbourne, from Joburg. So we've got a hugely international audience, which is great. And I think reflects the global reach of uh, festivals. So I'd like to welcome you to Edinburgh. Uh, it's an autumnal day here in uh, the festival city. Uh, so we've just obviously experienced a historic summer. So for the first time in sort of the history of Edinburgh's festivals, which is almost 75 years, we've actually been festival less. So we've had uh, really six months of our festival season uh, with no festivals. So this has obviously had mixed uh, views. Uh, there has been uh, some discussion and debate for the last few years as to whether the festivals contribute to over tourism in the city, uh, whether they're being commodified uh, and whether they are alienating the local resident community. Uh, but I think that what is clear is that without them, Edinburgh is a very, very different destination. Uh, and what we've seen uh, this summer is it's really evident the contribution that the festivals make to the city. You know, they're a huge part of the social, cultural and economic fabric of the city. And it really is a very sort of different place without them. So uh, Fergus Linehan, who's the director of the Edinburgh International Festival, again, one of the oldest festivals, uh, he wrote an article recently where he said that the festival, his festival, would be rethinking its relationship with the city and its people. And I think that's a sort of interesting thought to take with us as we go through uh, this morning. So today we're very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to discuss, discuss and debate all these sort of points and questions with three leading people from Edinburgh's festivals. So we've got Nick Barley with us, who's the Festival Director of Edinburgh's International Book Festival. Uh, and they've just completed uh, an extensive online festival of over 400 events uh, that went on at the same time as their book festival should have happened. We've also got Ollie, who's a communication specialist with uh, Edinburgh's Festival Fringe, and he's the head of marketing uh, and development and joined them in 2017. And again, the Fringe have just completed a weekly live stream series. So it'd be good to hear how that's gone. Uh, and then finally, we've got Julia Amore. So Julia leads the membership body for Edinburgh's major festivals. So obviously uh, that includes the book and the Fringe, but also nine other key festivals across the city. Uh, and they're the main uh, sort of body of the festivals. So Julia will be giving us uh, a sort of more contextual view in terms of what's been happening across all of the major festivals. So just a few sort of uh, housekeeping points. So we're going to have 10 to 15 minutes from each of our panel members. Uh, there'll be time for questions at the end and we've got uh, We've got some students who are very helpfully going to be monitoring the YouTube feed for questions. So any questions, you, uh, so that's going to be observed uh, all the time. Uh, and then, so without any further uh, ado, I think we'll move over to Nick uh, and get uh, his perspective. So uh, welcome, uh, Nick. So the three sort of areas we're looking at is how the festivals of 20. 2020 have been affected, uh, what are the future implications and any lessons learned from what's happened this summer? So welcome Nick. Thanks very much Jane and thanks also to Greg uh, for welcoming us to this amazing session and welcome to everybody from around the world, people in Barbados uh, but also friends and colleagues from Edinburgh so welcome to Rachel and Kate and Janie who are joining me from my team and I'm sure can put me right uh, in the things I say. I've got 10 to 15 minutes to talk about the book festival and about how it adapted to the conditions of 2020, this extraordinary year. But first I should just explain, uh, to reiterate what Jane said, that the book festival is one of a number of summer festivals in the city which have worked together over the last 70-odd uh, years 
to really create a city, a festival city, which is not only a city which welcomes, which doubles in size every year and welcomes half a million visitors, but which also tries its best to be a city which works for its citizens at the same time uh, and to present festivals which work for the local community as well as for the tourists who join us. So the book festival takes place as part of that mix and I'm, what I'm going to do is it, in a few brief slides try to explain this year how we coped with the coronavirus pandemic and tried to put on a festival in any case even though we couldn't do one in person. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and fingers crossed that I'll be able to make this work. Uh, and show you a little presentation about Edinburgh's Book Festival. I hope you can see that. All right. Now, <clears throat> anybody who arrives in Edinburgh in a normal year, uh, and I've put this in a kind of frame on the wall because it's, it's ancient history now, this is the kind of thing that I could expect to see. This is Edinburgh's Royal Mile outside the Fringe shop, a city bustling and really full to the brim with people enjoying the festival experience. It is quite hard to be in Edinburgh and not experience its festival in August. Um, alongside the Fringe, there's the International Festival, the Art Festival, the Military Tattoo, uh, the Jazz and Blues Festival, and the Book Festival. And this is us. We take place in a normal year in Charlotte Square Gardens and, and the streets around it. And it's it, this busy park is regarded as an, what's called an oasis of calm. Uh, this is quiet in comparison to some of the uh, city streets of Edinburgh. Um, but this is, you can see just how dense uh, it is, the, the normal site that we use. This is eight theatres, two cafes, bookshops, hospitality spaces, all arranged around what we call a village green, which is that green area in the centre um, where people can sit in the sunshine or in the rain uh, and drink a glass of wine or a beer and, and read a book and so on. And the festival then spills out into the streets around. Um, inside those theatres, this is what it used to look like. Uh, and imagine that now. This is our 750-seater New York Times theatre. Um, and every day there would be 10 different events, uh, with each full to the brim. And eight theatres, each as full as this uh, in the festival. As well as that, of course, uh, the, the normal festival was an opportunity to bring together extraordinary people and, and have them walking around in the village green. So here, this was an example of uh, Scottish writers Val McDermott and Ali Smith, together with Kareen Paulwood, who you can just see in the green cardigan in the background, the musician from Scotland, together on stage or arriving on stage with the Palestinian writer Nehruz Kamud. So the opportunity to meet literary heroes from all over the world. But also uh, backstage, behind the scenes, the opportunity for unexpected encounters for writers and, and for the participants in the festival. So this was inside the author's green room, which we call the yurt. This was the Reverend Jesse Jackson, the, the world famous American politician and clergyman, along with the, the debut writer Paul Kingsnorth in the middle. And on the right, of course, the actor Mark Rylance. They happened to be having a conversation in the year, and I took this picture. A great example of the kind of unusual serendipitous encounters that authors could expect when they came to the festival. So that was the old festival. Um, that on the 1st of April this year, we, along with all the other summer festivals, took the decision that we had to cancel the 2020 summer festivals. And so instead of those thronging crowds, this was Edinburgh's Royal Mile. And this was Charlotte Square Gardens, where we would normally run our book festival. But to say that the, that the festival's cancellation was as simple as that would be, would be slightly too simplistic. Um, because our festival had its problems in any case. Uh, the, the Scotsman newspaper, after our previous festival in 2019, had already run this story that the future of the festival was under increasing threat due to the, what it called the negative environmental impact of what we do on the garden. And so it was true that with the with climate crisis, the changing weather in, in Edinburgh, that it was becoming more and more difficult for us to look after the gardens in which the festivals were taking place with so many visitors and so much success. So we had to do something different this year, uh, but we knew we had to do something different in any case. This was the, uh, a quick look at the finances. In a normal year, uh, we would earn £4.2 million, which we would spend on running a festival and the festival programme around the year. 
But in cancelling the festival on the 1st of April, we immediately said goodbye to a million pounds worth of ticket income and over a million pounds in book sales and cafe bar income. What was left? Uh, one and a half million in sponsorship and individual donations and half a million pounds roughly in public sector support was still in place. But we knew that if we did nothing, the chances were that that one and a half million pounds in sponsorship would also disappear and the sponsors would walk away and, and feel that, we, that, we, that they would not leave their money with us. So we immediately went to talk to our sponsors and we contacted our individual donors and we asked them whether they would support us to do something different. And with almost no exceptions, they agreed and they said that we could use the money that they pledged for a festival to try to do something online. So that left us to our great fortune with two million pounds, partly to put on a festival but partly also to be able to pay the salaries of our year-round team, which would leave that team in place, and the key freelancers who are so crucial to putting on a festival, leave that team in place to prepare for a 2021 festival and beyond. So we bought ourselves the opportunity for a long-term sustainability as an organisation. But with that £2 million annual budget, we just set about creating an online festival, and we went back to our first principles. What are we doing a festival for? And what does it need to achieve in, in a new environment? And so we, we hit on these two key things. A festival, a book festival in particular, is all about intelligent public discourse. Uh, that might sound uh, difficult to understand, but if you think about it, it what that does is it understands that a book festival is not just about books and writers, but also about the audience who take part in it. Uh, it's about discussions between audience members and writers. Uh, and what's created in, the, in this interactive setting is what we call a community of thought. And we wanted to try to make sure we could generate a community of thought in an online festival. And so we decided that we hit on 150 events, 50 of them for young people and 100 of them for adults. But we would have events which would be free to access, crucial for our accessibility for people regardless of their backgrounds, on various different feeds. And we'd have this watch again function so that people didn't have to be there live in the moment, they could watch it later on, and they still can watch it now. And they wouldn't just be watching, but they will be participants. These were the crucial elements in putting together our festival. And then, using one of the empty fringe venues, the assembly rooms, we built two essentially broadcasting television studios. You can see that with the blue screen, that was the, the backdrop where the, the cameras and, and the stage would be. And the green screen on the left is for a British Sign Language interpreter. Now, it, wherever possible, we wanted to have authors or interviewers in the studio, but where it was not possible, as in this case, you can see in the central screen there, there's the Turkish writer Elif Shafak in an event. Uh, even when she couldn't make it into the studio, the sign language interpreter would be in the studio and all of the camera feeds would come through that bank of vision mixers uh, to allow us to control what we were producing. So no, just to be clear, we had two of these studios. So Janie, our, our site and operations manager, put together these two studios so that when one was in use, the other would be being uh, disinfected and deep cleaned so that we were, uh, had health and safety and, and all of the social distancing working requirements for, for during the pandemic. Where it was possible, like here, for example, with Ian Rankin and the journalist Ruth Wishart, we would bring them into the studio and we would film with multiple camera angles, the opportunity to zoom in and out. Um, but as I said, when it was not possible to bring them into the studio, uh, people would come in via Zoom. This was the central mixing area, which would then uh, feed all of the films out to different platforms, YouTube, uh, Vimeo, or our own platform that we built. And on our own platform that we built, here's an example with Elif Shafak speaking, along with um, an American ambassador, Samantha Power, and two New York Times journalists in an event about women in politics. You can see that the platform that we created had a chat room uh, in which people could register and then, and then discuss what was going on. Um, it also had, you can see at the bottom, an opportunity to buy the book, donate to the festival. And it gave us the opportunity to mix the vision so that uh, in this case, when Elif Shafak was talking, she would be large on the screen. Uh, then when Samantha Power spoke, then we could make her the large uh, face on the screen. So it was much more dynamic than a standard Zoom conversation. Another of the channels available was a question and answer function, which was moderated by us. So audience members could ask their question, 
other audience members could vote up questions that were their favorites and then our questionnaire moderators would feed the best questions through to our interviewers. Uh, it was very important to us in terms of accessibility uh, that we would also have a sign language function. So in this separate channel, it was possible uh, for people to watch a sign language interpreted event. And also in a further channel, we had live captioning. So that uh, this is a, this is the, the caption there doesn't actually relate to that event. It was just an example to show how it was going to work. But live captioning was available um, for many of our events. And then in the bookshop, we created this, another important element of interactivity, this opportunity for members of the audience who wanted to buy a book, then to meet the author uh, as if in the signing queue afterwards and have their book signed by the author. So here, I don't know if you can see, there's Ian Rankin with a book he's about to sign, but just in front of him, there's a kind of overhead camera and a pen, and he would open the book and speaking to somebody in a one-to-one -one Zoom session, he would then sign the inside the book, uh, dear, whatever their name is, and then that book will be sent to that individual person. So this is an extra opportunity for interactivity. The result, uh, and there was so much more than this, I, I, I really had to kind of skate through the basics, but the, this was the, the basic result. We felt we created a festival program we were proud of, it was true to our values, uh, it had fantastic events, uh, uh, diverse uh, events for young people and older people as well. And we were pr proud to, to achieve 200,000 viewers during the festival period. But I think more importantly than that, the average length of viewing time was an astonishing 43 minutes. So not only did we get hundreds of thousands of viewers, but they stayed, very many of them, for the full hour of an event, which I think is, is pretty extraordinary. Also extraordinary was that 50% of the audience came from outside the UK. The book festival normally has a, a very local audience. Normally at least 75% of the audience comes from Edinburgh and Scotland. Uh, and of the other 25%, many of them come from the rest of the UK. So the people who arrive at the book festival from outside the UK would normally be uh, around about 5%, but this time, 50% of the audience came from outside the UK. So this was an astonishing way to get Edinburgh on the international stage in a way that we hadn't expected. And the, the, the Google Analytics showed us that we had viewers in nearly every single country in the world. I think only North Korea, Nicaragua, and a couple of the Central African countries, Chad and, uh, and Central African Republic, were not present in the viewing statistics. So we, we have reached new audiences who would never have been able to come to Edinburgh and to its festivals before. Above all though, what we created was a way of pro pro producing interactive broadcasting, which will allow us in the future to reintroduce a live studio audience uh, at a rate which is possible, whatever the, poss the, the future brings, and to, uh, for, to allow us to present a hybrid festival with the expertise and knowledge of how we can produce an online interactive festival. And that I think is possibly the most important thing that we could do. So that's my quick skate through the book festival. I'll, I'll stop my screen share now. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Nick. I mean, I think that was an amazing achievement to actually do that in the short space of time you had to fully produce an online festival, which isn't easy, as we can see in terms of all uh, the equipment that you need uh, and obviously having the opportunity to take over a venue as well. And I think the most important thing in terms of accessibility is that you could do that for free because of the support of the sponsors and also the public sector, which maybe some festivals uh, didn't have. But yeah, that's a, a really brilliant uh, story. And as you said, you've got a strong platform there for the future. So can we move over to Ollie now and see what the Fringe did? That's great. Uh... Thanks, Jane, and, and thanks to Greg for hosting us, and, and hello, everyone. Um, that was hugely inspiring, Nick, so, so thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, and I'll try and do uh, justice to Fringe after that. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, and again, for the next um, five, so it's a 10 to 15 minutes or so, I want to give you a little bit of, of the Fringe context. Nick's done a really great job uh, of, of kind of summarising, I guess, this cultural melting pot that Edinburgh becomes um, every single August. And uh, I'm unashamedly gonna be sharing some similar photos to start off with to those that Nick shared. So 
Uh, if ever a picture tells uh, a thousand words, this is this is it. Um, and I think uh, what I would say about certainly the picture on the left is that we are not an event usually associated uh, with social distancing um, uh, as an organisation. This is right outside the fringe shop, similar space to where Nick's photo was taken from, um, just a year apart these two photographs, but as a demonstration of the challenge that faced us uh, in the run-up to August, this is, is a pretty good one. And it was very tempting at that stage, in all honesty, to say, you know what, um, let's come back in 2021 when hopefully things have quiet, quietened down a bit. But certainly uh, it was a, a massive and daunting challenge. And, and to take you back, if I may, for a second, to uh, the start of spring as we were making these discussions. And this, these, these, these are some factors that I think uh, impacted on lots of festivals all over the world, not just in, in Edinburgh, not just our own. But um, to take you through a couple of these, um, there was increasing pressure. If you remember at that time, there were lots of events either in the process of cancelling or being asked about cancellation. First, the European Championship football, Glastonbury, then the Olympics, Wimbledon and so on. And the drumbeat uh, that was coming to uh, certainly us and our sister festivals was growing all the time. And we needed to make an informed decision that was in the best interests of all of the different parties involved. Um, as a very practical point for our organisation, we had about 70% of our core team on furlough, so that gave us much less operating room than we normally would uh, to spin up something like a, a digital festival. We also clearly were adapting to all of our staff being uh, work, working remotely, and, and that in itself was a challenge as well as asking them to do a completely different, different job. Um, there is a very specific thing with the fringe, though, that made this a particular challenge, which is that unlike a lot of festivals all over the world, we do not have a single curator or panel of judges that decide who and who does not perform. Um, as that image suggests at the bottom left, if you can find a venue to host you and you have a story to tell, you are welcome at the fringe. Now, that's a, a lovely uh, thought and principle, but when it comes to working out what's possible and what's going to happen, within a fringe like no other, it's very difficult to plan exactly what that's going to look like, particularly because artists have been battered and bruised, having spent a year building up to, to August, as most of them do, only to be told come April time that actually that's not going to take place. There's a number of really practical uh, impacts in here, and clearly we all wanted to uh, make sure that we were staying very much within the bounds of social distancing guidelines. But just to give you a really practical example, uh, on uh, social distancing. The difference between a two metre and a one metre uh, uh, sort of distance between people made the difference for some venues between having sort of either a break even or making a small profit uh, in their space through to actually having absolutely no one in the space at all. So whilst obviously we ended up in a fully digital space, we didn't know that before, uh, when we were in sort of uh, April time. So actually how you plan that uh, becomes quite a challenge. Um, just very quickly on a couple of others. The first is that um, Nick uh, spoke very eloquently about taking his festival online and suddenly uh, reaching this international audience. Um, and I think that was replicated by festivals all over the world. And that's a fantastic opportunity for dialogue and debate, but it also means that you're suddenly competing for a share of voice with lots and lots and lots more festivals. And that, that in itself presents a challenge. And if all that wasn't enough, we also decided, um, perfectly timed, to announce uh, the cancellation on the 1st of April for April Fools. Um, uh, and I'm not quite sure exactly why we did that, but there you go, best laid plans. And that brings me, I guess, to the role of the Fringe Society. Uh, some of you will know this already, but for those of you particularly from, uh, uh, from overseas, the Fringe itself, as I mentioned, is, is not a curated festival in the traditional sense. And the Fringe Society is the charity that sits underpinning the festival does not curate, does not program shows, it doesn't run venues or bars or restaurants, any of that sort of thing. What we exist to do is to, to, to unite all of these many and various stakeholders that you can see on the screen and try and reduce the friction. We kind of act as a perfect catalyst in, in, in the ideal sense. So we're there to try and make sure that audiences see the work, that artists can get access to the media and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of them. We like to uh, actually move away from numbers, but I think in this context, it's super important to highlight some of the figures that, that are in here from the, the 500,000 or so individual ticket buyers to the 31,000 artists and over 300 venues that make the Fringe happen. So it is this glorious melting pot and community of lots of different types of people. 
I draw your attention also on this slide to the number of arts industry uh, buyers. So the Fringe is one of the world's largest arts marketplaces where people come to buy and sell work and curate um, uh, shows that go on to tour all over the world. Each year we welcome about 1,600 TV producers, radio execs, uh, theatre producers, other festival directors and so on who come to a uh, city from uh, around 31 countries. We also accredit around a thousand of the world's media coming again from 25 different countries. So you get the sense of just how large a challenge this was to try and build all these stakeholders. One of the biggest questions I was asked by journalists this summer repeatedly was why did it take the fringe so long to make a decision? And I hope this slide, if anything, highlights why it took a little bit of time to corral everyone and make sure that we got the right decision for, for all parties. And of course, residents being a key player in that. But what this also did was give us a really useful blueprint for what we needed to achieve and deliver within the activities that we rolled out um, uh, over the course of August and indeed uh, before that. So in the next few slides, I wanna talk you through what we achieved um, uh, and so what's gonna continue over the next few years. So I think probably most importantly, and it's not the, the sexiest topic at all, um, but uh, The Fringe receives only about 3% of its income as, as a society um, from the public purse, but actually the wider fringe receives even less than that. So there was a huge financial reality, uh, and dare I say it, Armageddon that faced uh, the many, many freelancers and venues that make the fringe happen each year. We estimated that uh, between our venues and artists, uh, fringe, the fringe stood to lose between 20 and 30 million pounds uh, in one year uh, for the festival not happening physically. And obviously this was gonna be devastating for the long-term future of the Fringe, but also for individual livelihoods of the 30 odd thousand artists that make the Fringe happen. Most of them, as I say, are freelance. They don't have a support mechanism. They're not in receipt of, of public funds. So that was a huge issue. So we went into a, a, a lobbying space working very closely with UK and Scottish government. There has been success in, in this space. I think uh, uh, fairly early on uh, in the window, we were uh, successful uh, thanks to a, a loan from uh, Scottish government uh, of a million pounds. Uh, we were able then to refund our registration fees to artists. So that was north of 600,000 pounds going straight back into the pockets of, of freelancers who, uh, as I say, were, were struggling. We've also seen in, in the last sort of week or two, uh, the announcement of the Scottish government's culture organizations uh, and venues recovery fund, which was a 15 million pound uh, pot uh, set aside to try and help uh, with this challenge. Likewise, Oliver Dowden uh, of the UK government announced a 1.57 billion package for the arts um, a, a couple of months ago. Inevitably though, people will fall through the cracks of those schemes and indeed the furlough scheme and, and other government support networks. So our job alongside partners, including Festivals Edinburgh, we'll hear from Julia in a minute, uh, the Creative Industries Federation and others, as well as artists and venues, that lobbying piece and making sure that the fringe remains top of mind and that its cultural, social and economic impact um, are, are seen uh, very, very clearly. Uh, just for context, the fringe uh, it was estimated to be worth about 200 million pounds to the Scottish economy each year. So there's a very strong story to tell. Keeping on the fundraising theme, we partnered uh, with Crowdfunder, the, uh, the UK's largest crowdfunding platform, to try and allow artists and venues to create their very own fundraising platform uh, to raise money, whether it's for their show or for an ongoing touring effort or for a whole range of other resources, we gave artists free advice and guidance, one-to-one -one sessions, a dedicated training course with, with, with online modules that people could drop in and out of. And thankfully over a hundred artists and venues got involved in that process. We are continuing this and will do uh, for the foreseeable future. Over 360,000 pounds has been raised uh, to date and almost all of that is in small donations. I think the average value of a donation is something like 20 pounds. So hugely, uh, uh, generous uh, support of fringe or, uh, uh, audiences in, in supporting the artists that they know and love. Um, we also, and I, I mentioned earlier about the arts industry, um, we wanted to make sure that the wheels of business within the fringe continued to turn, that the fringe was still seen as this really important platform um, for uh, buying and selling work. And uh, through our brand new fringe marketplace platform, which if I can coin a phrase is effectively the Netflix um, of the Fringe, uh, we connected a hundred shows that were already uh, ready and raring to go, not just for Edinburgh, but to tour internationally. 
to connect about 100 of those with buyers from, uh, in, in the end, 31 different countries uh, registered with us. So we wanted to try and make sure that this worked. We also supported that uh, with a Fringe Exchange Talks program, really tackling some of the key issues and threads that were uh, evolving over the period and had about two and a half thousand curators and producers join us over the course of August. So that, that worked um, extremely well. And again, that's another one that will continue uh, into 2021 and beyond. We also play a central role um, in artist support uh, as, as the Fringe Society. And normally in a Fringe year, we would pop up in Appleton Tower, which is right in the center of Edinburgh in the university uh, kind of district. Um, and uh, we would normally welcome thousands of artists to give them practical advice and guidance. We clearly couldn't do that this year, but we didn't want to lose uh, that opportunity for dialogue. So we actually took that online and offered over 50 panel discussions, workshops, drop-in sessions, and so on, uh, with partners uh, of ours, including Sick of the Fringe, who were particularly interested in mental health and well-being, uh, Pippa, who work uh, with uh, parents in the performing arts, uh, and Common and Fringe of Colour, who look at, respectively, um, artists of colour and uh, working class artists and trying to increase uh, access and opportunities uh, for those audiences. And we had about 1,300 artists engage with that. And again, that's something we'll look to continue next year. And then last but by no means least, we talked about communities earlier. We have a programme called Fringe Days Out, which engages with over 30 charities of all different shapes and sizes across the city centre and engages with people at risk of social isolation in particular. Um, we needed to continue that, but work within their own structures. So we organised community online artist sessions where we dropped artists into community uh, events um, uh, that were happening online. So Broomhouse Community Centre is an example uh, who work with uh, young people aged 13 to 18. We popped in a cabaret and circus performer into an event that they were already organising. We also uh, uh, piloted a socially distant street event uh, activity, some of the photographs you saw earlier, uh, with North Edinburgh Arts um, to try and see whether we could make that work and take learnings from it. And likewise, uh, with our sister festival, the Arts Festival, uh, had distributed over four, uh, nearly 500 art packs using the creativity and art artwork from our campaign to make sure that that inspiration was still there for those who couldn't physically attend um, uh, join the festival. And we also had fun with our audiences. So we created two platforms. I won't talk a lot for long on these, but we wanted to try and make sure that we captured something of the madcap spirit that makes the fringe unique. Um, but artists, uh, as I mentioned earlier, didn't have a huge amount of resource, many of whom were, were struggling to make ends meet. So we wanted to create a very low barrier to entry. So we thought the fringe is being miniaturized this year. We're having to take it online. What better than to ask artists to record a one minute clip, no longer than one minute, that might be a snapshot of your existing show. It might be a random skit. It might be a reflection on the Edinburgh that never happened. Um, but then we invited audiences to either pick uh, a, a random show from a series of set criteria or mix it up and watch uh, an effectively live stream of one minute videos uh, interspersed. And it is perfectly mad, perfectly fringe. And you can still see this uh, at pickandmix.edfringe.com. Um, over the course of August, we had nearly 400 videos submitted uh, and 300,000 views of those videos themselves. And again, this is something that we'll be bringing back in 2021. Uh, Jane mentioned earlier the fact that we also um, uh, broke with convention and decided to deliver four um, live fringe shows every Friday night at nine o'clock um, with the tagline nine, nine acts, nine p.m. and nine pounds a ticket. The reason that we did this, we wouldn't normally curate, um, but this was very much tied to our fundraising efforts. So the principle behind this was that any venue or artist that was registered within the last two years could sign up via Crowdfunder and could sell tickets to this show. And if they sold the ticket, they'd keep 100% of the proceeds. So it became a very easy way, even if you didn't have a major campaign to run as an artist, for you to make meaningful money. Um, we had 45 different artists take part in a huge range of genres from magic to circus to theater, comedy and dance. Um, we bought community events as well as um, uh, performers into the space. Um, and uh, we raised uh, an impressive 76,000 pounds uh, from ticket sales and from uh, add-on activity that went straight into a central artist and venue recovery fund, which we'll be handing out proceeds from in the next couple of uh, weeks and months. 
Looking to the future, I mean, I think the honest answer is who knows <laughs> at this stage. I don't think any of us have a have a crystal ball about where this is going to go. We're currently planning for basically all options for 2021, which is effectively a, a, a physical festival, uh, albeit at reduced scale um, with social distancing measures in place. I mentioned that one meter and two meter social distancing process. Again, we're speaking very closely to our venues on that. Um, a mixed model, which I think is probably the most likely at this stage, where we'll take elements of the digital events we've already delivered and also deliver those um, in person. Um, and a, a digital only festival much like this year, with the very big exception that we'll have a full 10 to 12 month run in time um, to get there. We'll always, though, keep one eye very strongly on 2022. For those of you who don't know, it's the 75th anniversary of the Fringe and indeed a number of our sister festivals, including the International Festival. And that opportunity, hopefully when uh, a vaccine's in place, hopefully things are returning to a degree of normality, we will be able to animate Edinburgh city streets as well as bring digital activity to the fore. And super quickly, what we learned from the experience, I think you've, you've heard from Nick already and, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate it, that collaborating with our sister festivals, we've done this for a long time through Festivals Edinburgh and other forums, but this was a year where we had to come together and where the strength of our singular message, particularly around that cancellation side of things, really paid off think, and really highlighted the fact that we were working in concert and together. Um, I think it's fair to say that the shifting nature of the pandemic made planning extremely tricky, especially with our community activities where we were obviously very conscious of working uh, particularly with, with more vulnerable groups about making sure that we were keeping the best available advice but when you're trying to risk assess for an event, even if it's largely digital, that becomes much more challenging um, as things were changing all the time. Two I really want to draw attention to is, is audience fatigue in digital channels. Now, I don't want to say this is a, neg a negative entirely, but I think we've all felt a kind of Zoom fatigue, if I can call it that, uh, over the last couple of years. And, and in particular, our community groups reflected this, that in the early part of us discussing these artist drop-in sessions, there was huge demand saying we really want this to happen. But over the coming sort of couple of months, there was a real sense of, well, actually, we'd much prefer it if you could do something that's physical because our audiences are getting, are getting frustrated there. I think also there's a real challenge around paying for content. And we've seen lots and lots of great examples of free content. Nick's given a, a, a really a brilliant example of that. Um, but as we look, particularly in a fringe context, to try and make this pay for freelancers, there's a real challenge and I, I then draw your attention to artist IP, which uh, we may well be asking questions about later. But this idea as we've seen with the Spotify's of this world or the way the media industry has gone in recent years, people are inclined not to pay for content and there are plenty of operatives out there. I was approached by 50 plus companies this year um, offering the earth um, and, and, and offering you absolutely everything, a panacea. But actually, when you look at the detail, a huge amount of that money was going into third parties rather than into the artist's pocket. And then last but by no means least, my newfound respect for fringe participants has only continued to grow. Their creativity and ingenuity in the face of enormous odds um, to see 300 plus fringe shows come to the city and everything from a treasure hunt across the city to comedy fundraisers to even, I think, a live stream of sheep in Stirlingshire. Um, we had a proper fringe experience, even though we weren't able to do that um, physically uh, in situ in Edinburgh. And that brings me to the end of my whistle stop tour. Um, but uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you at the fringe very soon. Okay, thank you, Ollie. Uh, that was great. So yeah, I think uh, we saw uh, the creativity and innovation we associate with the Thringe coming through uh, digitally in a lot of the events that you did. And it was also really interesting to hear about the community events, because uh, obviously accessibility is a barrier uh, for some communities uh, within Edinburgh. So it's great that you actually did do a few events where you went out into the community, obviously socially distanced. Uh, so we've heard then from two of our 11 festivals. So now we're gonna move over to Julia, uh, who hopefully will let us know uh, what happened with some of the other festivals and also give us a sort of more strategic view of the festivals going forward. So thank you, Julia. Thanks very much, Jane, and thanks to everyone who's on the uh, event today and to my two wonderful festival director colleagues. I always think that 
the festivals speak in poetry and sometimes I speak in prose, um, but uh, I hope that the prose and the facts that I'm going to kind of inject into our presentations just now um, will help, as Jane says, round out a sense of what happened in Edinburgh this year and how the festivals, the artists, the event organizers, the stakeholders, and the public, we're all kind of rallying around to make sure that our festivals survive this disrupted period and, and come back uh, stronger and better to be part of the um, sustainable event tourism uh, and cultural tourism business uh, for Scotland in the future, as well as, as we have been for over 70 years, an absolutely core part of Edinburgh's identity and uh, how our, our citizens uh, have a very a very high quality of life and how we can connect Stop. more with our citizens and, and come back uh, stronger and better mm -hmm. to be part of it. I don't know I don't know if other people are experiencing this but I have a bit of an echo from your um, feed so if you were able to put your mute on that would be great thank you very much I'm just going to share my screen at the moment and bring up my presentation and put it on full screen if I can do that. There we go. Um, hopefully that's appearing fine for everyone. Um, so uh, to just give a little bit of context, you've heard from two of our festivals a deep dive into the character of their festivals and how that interacts with the city and, and its audiences, local and international. This is how we became a world leading festival city. Um, it, it started with um, three festivals founded um, post-war um, as part of the kind of post-war reconstruction. Um, and over the years, it, it was characterized first by a concentration of quality and range in that peak season of August that we've been talking about. And later we had a diversification of art forms and year round festivals um, that has, has really characterized the city then as, as being a city where um, our creative communities and our audiences see festivals as an important expression of their identity. Um, by the year 2000, we sort of started to see our festivals more actively as a strategic cluster. And at that point, the, the festivals and, the, and stakeholders got together and created uh, more holistic strategies. And by 2007, the organization that I head up was born, Festivals Edinburgh. Um, and soon afterwards, we developed this Edinburgh Festival City cultural brand. So we're a bit like a chamber of commerce for festivals. We, we take an industry led approach to identifying with those major festivals what the key themes are that we could work on together to develop our cultural, social, um, economic and environmental contributions. Um, and that collaborative role obviously put us in a central position when the, the COVID-19 crisis hit. So very briefly, to set the scene about the position that we were in pre-2020 and the kind of trajectory that we were on, um, these numbers are from 2018, uh, which give a good picture. There are 2019 figures, but because of what's happened since then, we haven't had the chance to fully um, sort of audit and cross-check them. Uh, in, in 2018, we were looking at 4.7 million attendances. Um, and that breaks down to about 1.1 million individuals, which is which is an interesting point that we might come back to um, because uh, the, the large numbers um, aren't obviously uh, all individual people coming to the festival. There, there's an average of four ticket buying um, ac across the different festivals for, for every individual that that accounts for. Um, but uh, that is more than a FIFA World Cup. So it explains why Edinburgh has developed as quite a unique environment for, for major events. Um, what does surprise people constantly is that that audience is 60% Scottish, 40, nearly 40% Edinburgh, um, and 40% and from the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. Um, and actually, we've been the most popular cultural activity for locals, um, certainly for the past decade when the city has been polling that, um, that statistic. Um, and we would uh, be very confident that that's been the case beforehand. Um, and and that, that mix, we think, puts our festivals and our city in, in, in a more resilient position than would otherwise be the case for recovery and renewal and you know, reconnection with the balance of the local and, and the global. So to widen that focus out to the city and city tourism, um, these are figures from some of the official documents that the uh, city council and our economic development uh, Edinburgh Tourism Action Group have published, um, which show you again um, how the wider picture looked and how that had changed in the, in the years between 2012 and 2018. Um, we have succeeded on many measures in uh, 
being an economic success post global economic crisis in 2008. But like so many economies, that success hasn't benefited all sections of the city and it has become more stratified. So we're dealing with those issues as with, with, with so many other places. The main growth has taken place in overseas visits and in year round tourism, given the rise of cheap air travel and short term lets. But obviously that has created strain. And in recent years, the combination of the bite of austerity and that pace of globalization has, was affecting the city and its festivals to the point where um, you know, we were having serious debates about how to move forward. And just earlier this year, the city agreed a new tourism strategy for the next 10 years, which is, is prioritizing people, place and, and planet in you know, how we try and steer um, the, 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 the growth of the good growth and sustainable growth of tourism in uh, the coming years. Now, obviously the shockwave that hit um, a month after that strategy was published uh, because of COVID um, underlines the kind of urgent need to, to translate those principles into what we do post COVID. But we believe that the culture and festivals will be at the heart of that recovery that kind of focuses on responsible, curious and loyal visitors because uh, we do attract a particular kind of, of demographic. So what did that look like after the shockwave of COVID-19 uh, hit the UK? Um, these are figures from a dashboard that the Edinburgh Tourism Action Group pulls together. Um, and I know you can't see um, all of the detail and take it in uh, on this call at the moment, but I will make these slides available um, to the event organizers and hopefully you can use them as a resource afterwards. But just looking at that right-hand column, you, you can see that um, by a lot of metrics, um, people's uh, revenue, and footfall and so on is down by between uh, 70 and 90 percent um, in the peak season this year and our unemployment claimant count is very sadly up by 200 percent Edinburgh as the capital city of Scotland with uh, quite an integrated global um, economy has uh, been the worst hit of any of the regions of Scotland in in the UK which itself has taken a, a hard um, knock from uh, in global terms from from the Covid virus. So that's the, the size of the, the kind of mountain that we've got to climb. And uh, what that translated to um, was obviously uh, commented on by Nick and by Ollie and, and in our national newspaper, The Scotsman, um, they highlighted that uh, we saw a, a slump in 2 million uh, visitors or footfall in, in August this year. So, um, Immediate implications for the future. What I've uh, provided on the slide here is a, a sort of summary of a, a key um, sort of risk and opportunity document that we are updating uh, frequently for our, our stakeholders and our funders. I know you can't read all the detail on screen at the moment, but I hope that that might be a useful document for you to have access to. Just in terms of my observations on it, we, we have characterize the three uh, top key risks as being stabilization, because obviously we can't, as I say, um, be part of that, that more positive future unless we survive. Um, the persistence of long-term uncertainty and fragility in planning for events, um, and the, the need to see, to take a strategic view of events um, and festivals as part of a, a positive recovery, because I think it would be easy to, um, have a short term view and, and to say that events are having the hardest time getting through this crisis. So, you know, maybe they're not a, a sector worth backing. But I think the, the, the whole course of human history shows that, you know, that compulsion to come together and um, be a collective and, and experience new things together and uh, change our, each other's minds and understand ourselves and the world better, it, that is not going away in the long term. And um, I think it, it, it is a very important part of, of a sustainable recovery. Practically, what will it mean? Um, will People will have to refocus their energies on the host audience and the domestic creative sector. Um, we may be looking at the festival season to be spread further, both geographically and temporally. Um, we may need to refocus on live audiences among younger generations because older audiences will not necessarily feel comfortable coming out into crowds. That yo-yo na uh, nature of um, planning and of opening and closures is going to mean that people have shorter planning lead times um, 
and hedge their bets. Um, so, you know, that's obviously going to have an effect on artists and audiences and how we manage that in the most responsible way will be very interesting. And we'll probably have to live with a hybrid festival model for the foreseeable future, where, where a digital offer sits alongside any possible real world program, certainly for 2021. Um, so here's the here's the green side, the upside. Um, we, we've already shown and you've already heard from the other festivals that we, we can create lifelines through culture, even in this very difficult period. Um, that we are a platform for experimentation and innovation so that we can unlock live experiences for, for recovery. And that, that the kind of innovations that you've, that you've heard about will build the um, foundations for future resilience and relevance of the, of the sector. Um, digital is not the whole answer, although everyone's become more conversant with that and, and it is for many people uh, an, an, an integral part of the future. It's already clear that you know, it's not sustainable in the long term as a replacement, especially for festivals whose very essence is based on the interaction that happens in the fringes of the event, outside of the event, as well as in the, um, the performance itself. But the live does need rethinking. Um, we need to reimagine what those events could look like, and we need to support artists um, and, and technicians to be able to do that experimentation. The creatives need paying, as, uh, as Oli um, was emphasizing. Um, we need to find ways to ensure that artists can value, uh, our audiences can value artists' work, whether that's ticket, donation, maybe subscription. We need to, to look at all that. The host community is absolutely crucial. Um, we need to reconnect in a fundamental way with, um, with, with the variety of audiences and, and creatives across Edinburgh and across Scotland. And the whole model, as, as we've seen, needs reinvention. The business model of festivals must be based on those new value propositions, including those based on local inclusion and digital engagement. So coming to a conclusion, um, there's been a lot of challenges, as you can hear. But one of the things that's been uh, extremely positive is the way that it's brought people together around uh, more system level thinking. Um, and as Festivals Edinburgh, that collaborative platform, we've um, obviously been involved in a lot of those discussions at local level, um, at national level and at uh, international level and also uh, across intersecting communities. So the tourism community, which we're obviously um, talking about today, um, making the case for culture generally, you know, and because because festivals do not thrive unless the whole ecosystem thrives. And we're so conscious that there are people across every part of a highly um, SME driven sector and a highly freelance sector that are, are really suffering in all of this. Um, and also we need to keep up those links with our global networks because we're deeply international and we need to find ways to stay deeply international. So as we speak, um, the, a new sustainable festival city vision is something that's being agreed between the festivals and their city stakeholders um, that really recognizes that there isn't a return to the status quo um, and we must build in uh, ways of experimenting um, and piloting all of these uh, these new dimensions to our festivals. Um, however, I think to conclude, we've got one major challenge that we're we're very aware of as we start to transition to that new future. Um, since the times of Greek drama, um, festivals have been defined by those classical unities of concentration in place and time and action. Um, so, what happens when you interrupt those elements? Do you lose the essence of what it is to be a festival? What does a festival become? I don't think any of us thought that we were going to be in this position, but we're all part of a living laboratory now. And it's our responsibility to work through that and to find out together. And I look forward to discussing with, with you and with the other panelists um, what we think that means. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. So I think that pulled uh, a lot together what we've been discussing uh, this morning. And in particular, uh, I think we got a really clear indication there of the relationship of the festivals to both Edinburgh as a city and also to tourism and how important they are as drivers of tourism to the city. I also liked uh, Julia's uh, discussion of uh, respect, responsible, curious and local visitors to the city. This is what we want to engender uh, going forward. And also it's really exciting to see that they're working on this sustainable city festival vision. So I think there's lots and lots in there. So a huge thank you again to our three uh, panellists. We've been having lots of 
uh, positive comments through the feed about how inspirational the presentations have been. Uh, so well done uh, to all. So what we'll do now is we'll go, so maybe if the panel, you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, put your videos on and we can see you. Uh, and we've got quite a few questions coming through the YouTube feed. So the first question we've got is for you, Nick. Uh, so uh, the question comes from uh, Philip Long and he says, a festival of ideas such as book festivals competing or collaborating with the media. Uh, for example, things like uh, Guardian events or events that universities may be putting on. I think it's always been the case that ideas festivals have both simultaneously competed and collaborated with media. So that the book festival was sponsored by the New York Times. It was previously sponsored by The Guardian. So we've always had a, a, a loving relationship with them, but also a slight competitive relationship. Mm -hmm. It's always been a global marketplace as well, uh, weirdly enough, despite the fact that the, the festivals have always been very local. In actual fact, although we haven't been necessarily been competing especially for international audiences. We've always been competing for participants who choose whether or not they'll come to Edinburgh and have the choice to go to other places. So that's increasingly the case now, of course, in, in a global environment. Uh, now, I think, a bit, rather like with music streaming, which, which could concentrated into either Spotify or Apple Music, it's likely that some of the, the festivals, well, the smaller festivals may be under threat of dying away and that, that festivals may concentrate into large multinational mega festivals online uh, which attract the audiences but also the participants. Put it like this, every festival in the world like mine at the moment can invite Barack Obama to interview Greta Thunberg or they can invite the Pope to interview the Dalai Lama. Why would they not? Because we can beam them in from if they're willing to come. Why would they choose our festival and not somebody else's? We have to create something which is unique, and that's that's the the competitive urge now. One author said to me, um, a very famous author said, uh, "I'm excited to be doing my my event with the book festival online this year, but I have already done done half a dozen online festivals, and if and all of them are available to watch again. So if I make the same joke again one more time, then my mm -hmm. fans will start to realise that I haven't got that much interesting to say." So Edinburgh has to be a unique experience for me. Make me say something new. And this is the challenge for festival organisers now. Be unique, be of your place and attract that international audience to something which is special. Great, thank you. I'm going to move on now to another question which sort of links to that. So this is from Kenneth, Kenneth Wardrop here in Edinburgh. And uh, he said that obviously one of those defining factors and the uniqueness is obviously the location. Uh, and the city that often these festivals uh, take place in and how that acts as uh, a natural stage. So his question is, how might this defining character of the summer festivals be sustained if there's a move to totally online or hybrid event? So maybe Julia, can we go to you first for that? Sure, yeah. Um, Kenneth's absolutely right. We're a, we a small city of 500,000 people, but we've got a very, an even smaller historic core. And, and that is, transformed by the, the festival events that happen, especially in the peak season. But we also have the wonderful asset of having almost 50% green space in the city. It's, it's actually been uh, assessed as being the greenest city in the UK. Um, and so I think as we move into a phase of hybrid events, everybody's thinking about how we can use those green spaces better um, and how we can disperse activity um, which is easier when you're dealing with a more local audience because you're, you're, you're not necessarily having to be so close to the main transport hubs. Um, there, there is still a, a very important economic issue about how do you make it viable for the artists and the, and the presenters. So we do have a lot that we need to work through, um, which is about how we, we come together with partners and supporters to maybe create new festival hubs across the city. And I would see those festival hubs as being hybrid festival hubs. So um, people who are able to attend in person will be able to get that very place-based experience and, and will be able to be taken on a journey of discovery. Um, but there will also be need to be um, online capability so that that, uh, that online audience can be engaged as well. And hopefully the combination of the two um, will be able to in some way 
uh, convey that sense of the spirit of place that Nick was talking about. So that even if our new audiences are not all able to attend in person um, on, on any one given occasion, it will still kind of retain a sense of affiliation and, um, and friendship with, with that online audience and that they will see Edinburgh as a place that they want to come and explore, but explore more deeply and explore more often and explore for longer when they come, hence kind of feeding more sustainable tourism. You know, that would be, that would be obviously a vision. Yeah, and then Ollie, I mean, obviously one of the defining things about the Fringe is the opportunity to see performance in really unusual venues like toilets or buses or department stores. I mean, how can you convey a lot of that online, you know, the experience of going to those unique venues? Yeah, I mean, it's super difficult is the honest answer, Jane, and I don't, I don't want to pretend it isn't. Um, I think there have been some early green shoots uh, of this happening. Some of you might have come across the Shedinburgh campaign. Yeah. Uh, led by uh, uh, Francesca Moody, uh, the fleet of uh, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's producer. Um, and that, uh, for those who don't know, uh, popped uh, 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 effectively a shed as studio um, in Soho Theatre and indeed in the Trout uh, Theatre here in Edinburgh and then brought content live from the shed. Um, that, that definitely kind of fitted in with a fringe ethos, even though it wasn't necessarily a recognisably Edinburgh context, although they kind of dressed it to a certain extent with an Edinburgh feeling. So... There will, I'm sure, uh, given the kind of creative sector we have within the fringe landscape, there will be these ideas that come to the fore. But the reality is, uh, horribly speaking horribly practically at the minute, but a lot of the spaces that are most iconic within the fringe are the ones that are least ventilated, most difficult to get people in and out of, um, social distance queues, very difficult to manage. So that, that type of thing, even if you're managing that as a sort of digital broadcast, is going to be hard to do. So... Um, it, it's going to require a complete rethink, I think, on, on how those are. Okay, if I can stay with you, Ollie, and then I'll go to the rest of the panel. Uh, a question that has been directed at the Fringe is basically how are you working with public health agencies in terms of looking at, I suppose, delivering a Fringe going forward? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the honest answer is that um, over the last um, couple of, I mean, we can sort of split the two festivals, I guess, the one that's just gone and, and this one, we were taking regular advice at all stages uh, on exactly how that was going to work, both in, in terms of the advice we were giving to our venue managers through our quarterly venue managers meetings, and indeed to artists through our, our regular circulation list and made sure that those were uh, direct and up to date and giving, a, I guess, a forward look as well as the kind of immediate immediate picture. For our own activities with local communities, there was a whole risk assessment process that we went through that was again a, a kind of experience where we were, we were definitely sense checking those and seeing what was doable and what wasn't. If we look ahead to, to next year, I think it's, it's just too early to say exactly what that is, uh, albeit we have been given advice and guidance again, as I was saying, around uh, both the kind of one and two metre rule, um, around ventilation and what that's like to like we've, we've the West End theatres have had similar advice so we've been again collaborating with a number of people in that space as well to to share best practice on public health advice but I think I mean the key point clearly is that we're never going to jeopardize that that's going to be a top priority as for any festival so what we want to do is make sure that if we are giving advice to our network we're doing so so on the uh, sort of scenario based if you see what I mean rather than trying to say well it could be this so maybe plan for something I think we're, we're trying to keep it very robust and this is what it has to be or is very likely to be so that's kind of been yeah. the approach so far. Okay thank you and then Nick I mean obviously you actually have people live uh, within the assembly rooms uh, and you had a full production crew there so how and this was obviously uh, in August so how did you manage to navigate the public health uh, you know, restrictions associated with doing that? Well, by having two different studios so that we could deep clean one whilst the other was not in use, by maintaining social distancing within the studio environment and, and with, with a very, very strict set of, of guidelines um, that allowed us to operate the studio in a healthy way despite the, despite the strictness of the lockdown at the time, but but I think also next time we, we would learn that it should be possible to, uh, what's the word, disaggregate the festival experience. It is true that the festival has been located very much in the city centre in recent years, and it's possible, I think, mm -hmm. to have a kind of outside broadcast approach to online events. So podcasting, for example, 
from the suburbs should be possible and that's another way of making sure that we don't concentrate people too much into one space and try and learn about spreading the festival across the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question uh, is from David Jarman, and I suppose this is aimed at Ollie and Julia. Uh, so the current director of the Fringe, uh, Shona, has long wanted the Fringe to be valued for more than the number of tickets sold and the shows presented. Uh, that was before 2020. So what will this year do to change the way we value the festivals and their work and perhaps culture in general? So <laughs> quite an easy question to answer. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can say definitely what I hope will happen. And I, I think is already we're seeing we're seeing certain shoots of it. And um, what Shona has spoken about, our chief exec, a number of times is really a return to the core principles um, of what, what the Fringe was set up to do in the first instance. So for those who don't know, in 1947, eight companies, six of them from Scotland, turned up without an invitation to the International Festival and said, look, we want to play. Um, they weren't able to get a space on the programme, but they decided to perform anyway. They took a risk. They were prepared to put their, their money where their mouth was and perform um, uh, in often community centres and spaces that weren't really theatres in any way, shape or form. And that spirit of entrepreneurialism, of taking a chance of, of, of trying to put yourself out there, I guess, um, uh, has absolutely come to the fore this year. I think the, the precarious financials behind that have perhaps uh, gone under the radar as a result of the fringes growth. There's that sense of rather than it being seen as effectively a festival of festivals, you know, 4,000 individual shows, 2,500 of them being premieres, so risk at the very heart of it. Most of that's being taken by the artists and the venues that are putting on that work. Those, those creators have had a very, very difficult year. I mentioned the 20 to 30 million pounds shortfall in their, in their funding. If we value that work, um, and I think all of the signs are that we do, we have to pay for it, we have to support it, we have to take the action to make that happen. In, otherwise, we will lose that spirit of risk taking that is, is at the core of what the Fringe is about. Okay, thank you, Julia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it has surfaced all of that stuff that Ollie's been talking about. And uh, so it took a crisis to do it, but we now recognize that we need to value our, our, our artists and our presenters and our supply chain in a different way, uh, you know, as a society. Um, I think the, the value to audiences, the value to artists, the value to the city um, has, has to some extent been uncovered by the disruption of, of this year. Um, and uh, a trick will be how to capitalize on that. Um, so we, we understand, I think, uh, in more textured detail, how it affects people's lives and livelihoods from, from the point of social development, from, from the point of economic development, when we can see what happens when it's missing, you know, the sort of hunger that people have had, not just in our city, but um, nationally and worldwide to use culture as a source of, you know, fun and joy and inspiration and hope and courage during this period um, has, has, has been uncovered. And, but also I think, uh, especially here in this city, uh, almost everyone will know someone who's been affected by the fact that the festivals have not taken place physically this summer because the festivals do not just feed into the tourism economy, but they also feed into, you know, the local uh, distribution economy and service economy, you know, a, a, a much more widely. Um, so, some of the partners that I was mentioning that we're working with, uh, the Edinburgh Napier and the University of Edinburgh in particular, um, we have been talking about, we were talking about this before COVID, but I think this becomes more urgent now, about how we can put in place some more longitudinal kind of ways of understanding those qualitative benefits of the, of the festivals. And unfortunately, the big sticking point there is people tend to fund activity, they don't tend to fund research. Um, but if this um, awful period um, uh, raises the consciousness about the way that we need to understand how the system works, then I think that is one of the sustainable benefits that could come out of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Julie, if I can stay with you, uh, we've got a question that says, uh, I don't know if this is a loaded question, how would you describe the festival's relationship with politicians locally and nationally. I would, sorry, you, you, you I, sorry. I experienced a little bit of disruption there. Could you say that again? Yeah, sorry. Uh, how would you describe the festival's uh, relationships with politicians locally and nationally? 
Yeah. Uh, we are obviously uh, a kind of beacon in Edinburgh. We're a very high profile set of set of events. And so that sometimes leads to controversy. But but fundamentally, because obviously part of my role and, and my colleagues role is is speaking uh, with the elected representatives um, on a regular basis. And, and what we fundamentally get back is that people say we recognize that the festivals are hugely important for the city and for the nation um, and that they are in the DNA of, of, of Edinburgh. Um, what we obviously then spend most of our time talking about is that those issues that I alluded to about the, the way forward and achieving the balance, you know, um, and it's, it's not easy because resources are finite. Everybody um, has on their agenda the uh, widening, widening access and uh, in, including more people across the city who, for, because of various barriers, whether those are economic barriers or distance barriers or barriers of um, caring circumstances or barriers of, of confidence and, uh, and, and psychology, everybody wants to be including more of those people. Um, but when you look at economic development and social development as um, competing areas that you might want to put um, public funding into, you, you, you know, we all of us have to come to uh, uh, a, an agreed consensus as to you know, where we're going to strike that balance. And, and that very much faces us at the moment because we, we need to collectively decide, that's part, part of what this shared uh, sustainable festival city vision is about, is getting together with the stakeholders and the funders and saying, you know, how much do you want us to be driving economic recovery and how much do you want us to be uh, driving uh, community well-being? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anybody else from the panel want to comment on that? I'd just say that uh, politicians love Edinburgh's festivals and uh, they love attending. Uh, every year there are a great many politicians who attend as audience members in festival events but also they take part in the festival. So, for example, the former Scottish First Minister, Alex Salmond, had a fringe show last year. Uh, he, he appeared every day in conversation with various people. The current Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, appears at the Book Festival every year, as does the former uh, UK Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and also the former Conservative Party leader, Ruth Davidson, regular, regular attendees in Book Festival events on our stages. So they understand the value of, of the uh, the participation, that they, that, as well as uh, having their say on on the future of the festivals. Okay, thank a, you. A very brief thing to add to add to what Nick just said. I, I think the, the the experience that we've had uh, very much is that that support that's been quite that's been absolutely there in a in, in a kind of identifying with what the festival is in in general um, has been added to this time, and this is one of the positives I think of the last couple of months by a better understanding of the business models, not just of our festival but of others. And, and how that works and how it needs to be underpinned. And, and that has given us an opportunity to get in front of people that we wouldn't otherwise have got. Okay, we've got a couple of questions which relate to uh, the local resident community. Uh, one from Annalise and one from Brian Kings uh, in Hong Kong. So I'll try and uh, combine them. So basically uh, the question is, how can you engage uh, local audiences across the whole destination and beyond just the traditional audiences uh, and do online events uh, hinder uh, or encourage that uh, and sorry, yeah and then also uh, how about events in the suburbs which I think uh, was it one of you talked about that uh, and you know, we've heard a lot of sort of anti-resident sentiment about people coming into uh, local areas at the moment. So are residents receptive to visitors in residential and suburban areas? So really just the relationship with the local community. Okay, so Nick, do you wanna go first? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd say that uh, as Julia's graph showed, uh, the, the fest all of Edinburgh's festivals have got a very large local audience uh, percentage of, of, of the, that comes from the local area so we are very successful and very popular already however it is also true to say and we're well aware of it that there are a number of people who have felt excluded from Edinburgh's festivals and in recent years all of the festivals have have put in extra efforts to try to uh, in, encourage engagement from communities that didn't usually engage uh, the book festivals experience this year uh, as working with in North Edinburgh with communities of people who hadn't previously come to festival events 
allowed us to put to put on an event at this year's festival, which is called Stories and Scran. The Scran, if you don't know Scots, it's a Scots word for food. And so we had something about like a hundred participants, each of whom was sent a meal by a partner organisation, a voluntary organisation, which actually sent a meal to their houses. And people joined uh, in the event on they were on, they were Zoom participants, and they ate their meal together whilst listening to stories and poetry which had been had been prepared by some of those community participants and it was just a wonderful sharing of food words and ideas uh, within a community who had previously felt excluded and just very quickly before I pass on to Ollie this this idea of digital exclusion is important uh, it's important that we don't imagine that everybody has access to the digital realm However, I think there's something else to lay on top of that, which is uh, it comes back to your idea, Ollie, of, of digital fatigue. I think it's more complicated than you suggested, frankly, because, um, for example, we don't talk very often about television fatigue. We don't expect that people have watched so much telly that they can't be bothered to turn on again. I think the problem is that, that many people are choosing not to turn on digital events in the first place who would otherwise have come to live events because they imagine it won't be for them. So there are people who are formerly locals who did come along who are not coming. And they would say, oh, yeah, I'm just sick of all this Zoom stuff, digital fatigue. But actually, it's something else more complicated. Um, so uh, I think we've, the, the problem is probably the quality of, of the events that have been put on in, in the digital realm, which hasn't been of a high enough standard. That's why people are not turning on rather than because sometimes they don't, because they don't have access to the technology in the first place. Okay, it's thank an absolutely, you. It's an absolutely fair point, Nick. I, I, I perhaps should have called it Zoom fatigue specifically because it does it does fit this kind of context in particular. Um, just to speak, I guess, uh, to some of the, the fringe experiences uh, of that and, and of this specifically, it's probably two that I'd draw out. The first is that we've worked in partnership with the University of Edinburgh and the list just to use the the three million ticket data data sets that we've got. Um, so we have three million records every year of people buying tickets. We've mapped that onto the city and use that to identify areas that are of the greatest pinch points. Uh, it won't surprise those who live in the city that things like the Royal Mile and, and parts of, uh, sort of South Bridge and that sort of thing are the areas that get most congested at very specific times. And then we're looking to feed that back both to our programmers, so the venues and artists that are putting work on, but also looking to identify through our mechanisms, things like ticket collection points, we put one down in Leith about three, four years ago. There are now 12 venues that sit around that collection point. So there are levers we can pull to try and encourage that um, kind of dialogue. Um, that said, I would say that there's certain areas, and Leith is a really good example, where the population and demography are very open to the idea of events popping up on their doorstep. There are others where that's a much longer conversation that's going to be much more nuanced, and the type of event is going to need to be very different. Um, part of the experience we've had with our Fringe Days Out program, so this is the, the, the 30 community groups that we work with across the city and everything from the Sikh community with Sikh Sanjog in Leith through to contact the elderly, so picking up on what Nick was saying, to Cyrenians who work with uh, the homeless across the city. There are very, very particular challenges uh, with those groups. Um, access to digital technology is, is very varied, as, as Nick was saying just now. Uh, appetite to engage with digital technology is different and what's provided is, is very different as well. If, if we think about uh, Lothian Autistic Society, we're working on a project with them just now around a, an app that helps you move around the city and get a sense of, of the fringe before the fringe happens. But a, a huge number of this, the, the workshops we're doing with that group are about actually how do you engage that at a point that feels sensible and sensitive and, uh, and it isn't just another input that overloads. So I think it's a super nuanced conversation and as I said, every different uh, group of stakeholders, every different community is going to be slightly different. So we have to sort of bear that firmly in mind as we can. There's one other thing I might add, if I may, very briefly, Jane, which is about our, the work with schools and our work with schools over the years, which was not possible this year, but normally our work with schools enables us to bring in audience members whose families would not normally engage with festival events. And that's a wonderful connection through the uh, students and pupils with families uh, who are, feel excluded from the festivals. Um, so it's very important that we get back to working with schools as soon as we can because of the community activity that that then generates. Okay, good. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I think we've got three minutes left. So, uh, so as I've got a, 
a final question uh, to all of you, which, I mean, obviously we've heard some amazing things that have happened and some great plans uh, for the future, whatever the future may hold, uh, and a real awareness of the risks and the opportunities that lie ahead. But could all of this be possible without uh, government and public support? You know, can the industry sustain itself or do we need that continued injection of uh, substantial funding into the cultural economy. Julia, start with you. Yeah. So uh, at the moment, the oh, well, pr prior to 2020, the statistics were that the Edinburgh festivals uh, collectively um, were supported by about 25% public funding and, and raised 75% of, of income themselves through their various activities. Mm -hmm. um, and that public funding amounts to about 10 million pounds a year directly um, and the economic development of the uh, benefit of the festivals solely the economic development benefit not all the other benefits that we've been talking about is is over 300 million pounds a year to 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 scotland so and it's going to be difficult but in public policy terms i think that uh, culture is such fantastic value that mm -hmm. we are uh, heartened by the discussions that we've had with um uh, the stakeholders and the funders about recognizing that uh, Scotland has an economic recovery um, advisory group which advised that culture should be absolutely the heart of economic recovery because it can provide such dual benefits to reviving communities and and helping individuals and their well-being so we it would be a very very different system um, if it was a non-subsidized system and I don't think that's what the people of Scotland or the government of Scotland or the parliament of Scotland want so I am optimistic about that. I would say, I would say, art is a social necessity. In the same way that health is a social necessity, we fund our national health service because it's needed. It could probably survive without uh, government funding, but it will be the worst for it. Art is needed for our sense of self, for our understanding of society and our place in the world. It's not just entertainment. It's about. Uh, how society functions so we need it and so yes government support is is absolutely essential okay thank you yeah. Ollie. I, I'd just layer on top of that, not, not wishing to sound like that kind of shameless capitalist in the mix, but um, sort of <laughs> on, on, on Nick's point, I think there is also a, an element which has definitely been part of the conversations that we've been having and I know that Julia has been having about the value for money of the arts as it as it sits. Um, if, if we if we abstracted the kind of return on investment for public investment in the arts and put another industry sector's name above the door, I think there would be a lot more political will to support it. There'd be more public will to support it. I think there's, we've seen and, and, and know better than some of the UK government's um, uh, slightly misplaced retraining ads that we've all seen with, with, with a ballet dancer, for example, retraining in coding. There is still an underlying um, und undermining and undervaluing of what the, the economic impact is. I mean, I think absolutely the social and cultural value, but um, that the arts and culture do pay. They are, they are a huge success story for, for the UK, for Scotland, and we've undersold it for too long. And just because the sector through no fault of its own is facing very, very grim times at the minute, um, we were another sector I think that support would be absolutely guaranteed and I think that's the place we need to get to is where we value it uh, for yes for its intrinsic value we value it for its cultural its social impact but we also value it because it is sustainable it is financially delivering um, uh, as an industry almost almost sort of two to one on many other comparative sectors. Okay. Thank you. So I think uh, there's some great takeaways there. And I think one of the things that Julia said uh, earlier sort of resonated, you need to value the art. So it ties into everything we've just said. Uh, and also that that hunger for culture won't go, you know, it's always going to be there. And it's time now that we do start to invest in culture and invest in cultural destinations uh, like Edinburgh. So Thank you to our panel, to Nick, to Ollie and to Julia for taking time out of, I'm sure, very busy days uh, and lots more Zoom fatigue to follow. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also to our audience around the world uh, as well.
so I really sincerely hope that we do see some live festivals next year here in Edinburgh. Uh, and I'm sure that the creativity will flow uh, even if we're going to a, a hybrid uh, model. So thank you to everybody. So for Atlas participations, we are continuing uh, for the rest of the day with some presentations uh, and another panel discussion later. But for now, we're gonna leave uh, the Edinburgh festivals. So thank you again to everybody and uh, have a nice rest of your